Hey there, fellow knowledge seekers! Welcome back to our channel, where curiosity meets discovery. If you've ever missed any of our captivating videos, you're in for a treat with this compelling compilation. Whether you're seeking entertainment during a dull moment, a pleasant backdrop to your activities, or simply aiming to make the most of your free time, you've come to the right place. Don't miss out! Hit that subscribe button and don't forget to activate notifications. That way, the next time you find yourself unable to sleep or yearning for a fresh dose of intriguing insights, you'll know exactly where to turn. No more restless nights or wandering thoughts. Alright, let's dive right in. What screams, I have a crush on you! Viewers Edition. Story 1. Time to share my situation. There's a cute girl on my bus whose style I really like. Being the forgetful guy I am, I can't remember if I started staring at her and she caught on to this and started staring back to indirectly point out how weird I am, or if it's the other way around and she started the whole staring thing. Once there was an occasion on said bus where someone I was pretty well acquainted with offered me some candy. I took off my headphones and thanked him for the candy. The catch is, this guy is also acquainted with the girl I mentioned earlier. I kept my headphones off for a while and heard this flutter and I heard this flutter during their conversation. Yeah, he's that guy who always looks at me weirdly. Thinking back on it, I'm happy she didn't say I'm weird, I'm just it's just the way I glanced over was. As a result of the topic shifting to me, she goes for the aforementioned eye contact thing she slash I always does. I can't remember if she asked me anything else besides what my name was, didn't catch her name. After a while, the guy with a box of candy who didn't want to offer any of the girls any candy gave me the box because he arrived at his stop. One of the girls asked me if she can have some candy. I refuse because I kind of don't want to. Then the girl I like asks me to. In an internal panic, I quickly decline because I don't want to let on that I feel something toward her by giving her special treatment. They both asked me maybe two more times or something for some candy. I can't remember if I eventually gave them any. Oh yeah, crap, I forgot to mention something important. This was on the same bus ride. I believe she asked me why I was always looking at her weirdly, being unsure of who actually started the stairs that we do. I quickly replied with, what? No, you're always weirdly staring at me, in a non-condescending tone of voice. I'll wrap this up by mentioning the last important incident in my story. I was getting off the bus, she was staring very intensely, and I caught her gaze for a solid four seconds before blushing and saying, stop staring. The bus rides after this. She still glances at me sometimes, but keeping in mind she thinks the staring is weird, I try my best to avoid her gaze. Works only half the time. It's been a long while since she stared at me like she used to do, so maybe I'm creepy after all. I'm kind of stuck on the point of why didn't you give that first lady who asked you some candy, huh? Like, you got the candy for free from a guy, right? Like, the guy just like, yeah, here, I'm, this is my stop. Have the rest of my candy. And then you didn't want to share it? Ah, I'm just a super sharing type. I don't know. But if you had offered her candy, then you could have looked at the girl that you stare weirdly at. <laughs> and then finally, do you want some? I'm not saying you're staring weirdly. I don't know. It's always hard to tell in those situations. Uh, best thing I can recommend is just always wear a blindfold. Never look at anyone. Story 2. I had a crush on this guy in my math class. I kept staring at him. He'd glance back as I looked away. We'd exchanged this interaction for a few days in class, so obvious. I was incredibly nervous because we were in math extension class, me thinking I was the dumbest one there, me thinking he was one of the smartest ones there. I thought he was way out of my league. I texted him the next day. I shot my shot and we texted for hours after hours. And if this didn't scream I have a crush on you to him yet, the next thing definitely did. I wanted to confess my crush to him. I was talking to all my friends about it, nervous. I'm going to do it, I told them. I'm going to tell him after class. At this stage, we started chatting more in real life than online. A few hours passed by. It was after class. I was ready to tell him. We grab our bags and walk close together. My friend and his friend are walking slightly behind us. My friend next to me is whispering things such as, Do it, do it. OP, do it already. He hears this and looks at me with a confused look. I noticed he is now confused and is waiting for me to explain myself. I could have reacted like a normal person, playing it off cool. However, I got scared and stressed. I was already so nervous from excitement because I was so close to him. I, uh, um... I then continued to forcefully press my hands against his chest, pushing him into the bush next to us, and I ran off. 
Yeah, I started crying to all my friends. I ruined it. He thinks I'm so weird now. I didn't even mean to push him. I thought that I completely ruined everything. My reputation, my relationship with him. All his friends will think I'm weird, and now every math class will be insanely awkward with him. Well, he was laughing with his friends, still confused as to what just happened. He was okay. So, like, maybe if a girl pushes you in a bush or a friend is whispering things to that girl as they're talking to you, they might have a crush on you. I wouldn't know, though. That story is now a story my best friend and I laugh about. My boyfriend and I laugh about. We've been dating for almost two years, and I hope we become more than high school sweethearts. The one thing that I think is <laughs> really adorable about this story is you're basically like, I'm not very good at math, but he's really good at math. He's way out of my league. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that there's anyone... <laughs> Who's really putting, like, math skills as a big prerequisite for any romantic interest. I think you're fine there. And I'm also very happy that things worked out. This is actually a really, really cute story. And that happy ending at the end, two thumbs up. I'm giving you some, some razzin, but all because I liked it. Story 3. No one ever knows when I have a crush on them because I do the absolute best to avoid interacting with them. Even if I have a minor attraction to someone, I basically ignore their presence. It isn't an attempt at playing hard to get. I genuinely just find it so anxiety-inducing when the possibility of interaction arises. It genuinely sucks because then interactions become super awkward on my end since my original intent was to avoid interacting with them in the first place to avoid being awkward so it just piles up. I once had a heavy crush on a guy in high school, and despite exchanging light greetings every morning, I would still attempt to walk by the only hall I could walk by to get to my classes, where he conveniently sits, and act as if I did not expect him to be there. Then he would say, Hi, Blank! I would suddenly become alert, and then shuffle off after a quick greeting back. My avoidance of him became so bad that I started wearing headphones and listening to my music loud enough to make it seem like I completely missed any greeting attempts he had made towards me. Even though he sat there every day, and we greeted each other every single day. I feel very stupid thinking about it after the fact, and I'm positive he might have thought I hated him at some point. Story 4. A girl very obviously had a huge crush on me in middle school. I thought she was kinda cute, so I was open to her approaching me, but either from us both being 11 or her being a psycho, she started doing really weird crap. She would learn what route I walked home, deliberately walked in front of me, then told her friends that I would follow her home. I would sign up for the science club. The next week, she would join. I would start learning an instrument. She would join the group lessons. I start playing a sport. She does everything she can to get on the same team. I would frequently catch her staring at me, she would look away, then get one of her friends to come over and tell me that she doesn't like me. It was blatantly obvious that she was crushing on me, and the third time one of her friends was sent to tell me to stop staring at her, ironic, I gave her friend a return message. Leave me alone, stop following me, stop joining all my hobbies, and stop staring at me. Just leave me alone. The next day, I was called into the principal's office to find out she had formally accused me of stalking her and that I had hit her, giving her a black eye. Her complaint was very detailed and included the exact time that I had allegedly hit her. She didn't account for the fact that I signed up for everything first, and she followed a week later in the exact same order, indicating that she was following me. The final nail in the coffin for her was that the time she had been adamant that I'd hit her was during a music lesson. Over three dozen people, including teachers, had seen that I was there, I was a soloist, and that she was not there. My parents were called, and after hearing the full story, my father gave the principal an ultimatum. Either the girl gets expelled for creating a potentially physically dangerous situation, or we get law enforcement and the Board of Education involved and press charges against the girl as well as the school for failing to protect their students from potentially criminal behavior. It may have been a little excessive. We were only 11, so she was possibly just socially inept, but I didn't see her after that. Yeah, I uh, I have to kind of agree with uh, your your statement there at the end, where I think that that might be a little aggressive, because you're both 11, and yeah, she might have had a crush, she might have just been a weird, awkward kid, she might have just been 11 years old. 11-year-olds are weird. <laughs> I mean, I'm weird now, but I was definitely weirder as an 11-year-old. Like, a lot weirder, so... Uh, I don't know. Not to say, like... 
there should have been some curbing of what she was doing, like a parent being like, yeah, no, that's not okay. But, uh, I mean, a lot of it does just seem like kids don't know how to deal with emotions. Story 5. I remember in high school during my second year, two girls in my class that I suspect had a crush on me. Or at least one of them. I didn't really interact with them profusely, but that quite increased when approaching the end of the year. I would sometimes take another bus line than the one I used pretty much all the time, which meant another stop. They were always coming at this spot for one of them to get another bus. Each time I was there, I saw them, and we talked together while waiting for the buses to get there. The conversation often had a part that looked like this. Girl 1 says Girl 2 has a crush on me, and Girl 2 says back that Girl 1 has a crush on me. They were very friendly and all that giddy stuff as well. I remember once that they wanted me to take pictures of them together with another friend, which I helped with. It always confused me as much as I felt flattered. I never knew the truth even after four years since those events started. Sometimes I feel like one of them truly had a crush on me but was too shy to admit it, and the other girl played on it. That makes me regret that I didn't get to continue contacting both of them and even friends from high school in general after I finished my last year there. Picture perfect family with some dark secrets. Viewers edition. Hey folks, quick content warning for this video. There will be instances of S assault and abusive behavior. So if you're kind of sensitive that it's stuff, this might not be the video for you. Story one. Oh my God. So I had an Instagram mom as a neighbor last year. On Instagram, she was the most attentive, caring, loving mom that was constantly taking him places like museums and hikes and would post every single toy she bought him, would post her homemade meals and all that big picture perfect stuff. The first time I noticed that something didn't add up, he came over to my house to play with my son who's a few years older than him. They were in my backyard while I started making dinner. He had been at my house since three or so. I got plates ready and told him to go ask his mom, go ask his mom if he could eat spaghetti with my son. When he got back, he asked me why it looked weird. I said, probably because I used ground beef and then mixed it with the sauce and didn't put cheese on it yet. He tried it and was literally telling me with how every bit how good it was. How he didn't like the spaghetti his mom made now, lol. His mom came over at like almost 8pm to get him and said thank you but was surprised he ate it. I asked why. She said she's never made him spaghetti before and he actually might not have ever had homemade spaghetti. I was like, wait, what? You post food from your kitchen daily. She door dashes, puts it on her plates, then posts it. Oh well. Later in the summer, he started coming to my house as early as 7.30ish to play. I would immediately make him cereal. Throughout the weeks, I noticed when he went to his house to get something, I could hear him talking outside. I let it go. Coming to find out his mom was locking the doors and communicating with him through a ring doorbell camera. She wouldn't unlock the door if she didn't think it was important. She would call me in a panic to send him over because his dad was coming to pick him up. She didn't want him knowing he was basically in my care from about 7.30 a.m. to around 10 p.m. or 10 p.m. daily. Neighbors would text me asking if I was home as the kid was waiting outside for hours until my son and I returned home. Called the cops and told them the situation. I don't want to be I don't want it to be a big thing, but I'd ask multiple people. I'd ask mom multiple times to not lock him out and to not send him to me so early. Never helps. Cops called back a week later and said that because he was being taken care of, he was able to communicate with her through a ring doorbell and that he was being fed, etc., that CPS wouldn't come out as it wasn't extreme. I'll never forgive that crap. <sighs> this is the kind of, like influencer culture dash that so many people are after that I just can't wrap my head head around. I know that I, I, I wouldn't call myself an influencer. I'm not influencing you to get anything. I don't think. And I, who am I? I'm nobody. People don't even know my name. <laughs> um, but it, it's weird for me to talk about it. So take it with a grain of salt, but People who are, like, chasing this stuff to the point where they're just faking everything to try and get, you know, the attention. Posting fake meals and stuff like that and pretending like you have the best family when you're ignoring your kid. I just, I feel like stuff like this is becoming more and more common. I keep hearing about this stuff and I just, 
folks, you got to be able to just live your life. Don't chase everything online. I know I do this, but like I work within specific hours. I don't work on the weekends and everything, you know, I get stuff done ahead of time. I try and make sure that I can actually live and enjoy my life. And I'm not just chasing clout. I, I, that just can't possibly be healthy. You know, I mean, uh, I don't know. I could rant about this forever. No one wants to listen to me. You're all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eh. Story two. As someone who has experienced mental, physical, and S abuse slash assault from not just both sides of the family, but from kids at my school and old daycares, I cannot begin to explain how messed up these people are. Okay, so here's a story. This is just one of many, though. When I was younger, my mom and dad would c fight constantly. I hated watching them fight, so it would always bring me to tears. A few years later, they separated, and when it came my time to see my dad, who would S assault me, and since I was five at the time, I didn't know what it was, but it still made me feel upset and made me cry because I knew it was wrong. Then when I was seven, my mom gave birth to my younger sister. We found out her dad was on drugs, so my mom and her dad broke up and we moved with my Mima. I still had to see my dad and deal with that same crap over and over again. As for my Mima, she would abuse us, and if we didn't do something how she wanted it done, she would manipulate us and cause my mom to freak out, which made her start to scream and yell at us when our Mima was angry. I couldn't even read any books without anyone yelling at me. That's how insane it was. Now I suffer from phonophobia, the fear of loud noises, depression, and anxiety. Thank you, horrible families, for those traumas creating scenes. Uh, this kind of stuff... It really breaks my heart to read this kind of stuff because there's not a lot I can say except that things can always get a lot better. You can eventually get away. Eventually you get to an age where you can talk to someone that you can trust, an adult figure, um, someone. But I encourage anyone in a situation like this to please do that as soon as you are able to. And... Um, I wish I had um, better advice because when, when you're that age, it's so tough. And um, I mean, I, kids that age aren't going to be watching my videos. But folks, if you have kids, please teach them to trust you enough to tell you when something as awful as this is happening. I... Yeah. Story three. I have one. Be warned, it is long and a bit effed up. My old friend from third grade came with a lot of money. They would dress her in the best clothes, give her the most expensive school supplies, and she was tutored at home to make sure she was at least a grade above everyone else. But when she went to school, she was never sent with lunch money or food from home. She told me on many occasions that she was not allowed to or she would go without dinner. I would share my lunch with her because I felt so bad. When lunch ended, she would sneak under the tables and eat scraps off the floor. And when she was found by staff, they did nothing about it. They would make her a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and send her back to class. As I got to know her, she told me that her parents were too busy to hang out. I went out of my way to invite her to choir and art after-school activities. I was actually invited to her house one time. I was scheduled to leave the bus with her. I was excited because she told me her room was huge, that her house had a pool, and she had a computer that we could play Barbie games on. When we arrived at the stop, her mom told the bus driver that plans changed and I wasn't allowed to stay. Both of us were super crushed. We tried to make a sleepover happen a few times after that, but her parents kept saying no. I knew her for about four months before she stopped coming to school. I don't remember the specific reason, but I'm pretty sure some of the kids in our school told their parents about her and they reported it to the authorities. I asked around to see if anyone knew what happened to her, but it was all rumor and speculation, like she went to Hollywood, they went on vacation to Europe, a family member died, etc. Story 4. When I was young, I thought my family was absolutely perfect. Nothing was wrong between my parents and life was great. Until last year, December, when my parents told me they wanted to divorce. It turns out my parents aren't the picture-perfect people I thought they were. My mom had a horrible childhood, and she would literally have to take care of her parents because they would be drunk and smoke a lot. I don't know much about my dad, so I won't go in-depth there. 
All I know is that things were happening behind the scenes, and I never knew until this year. I was so confused and realized that they have been hiding it all from me. They told my brother and sister, but never me. I'm always the soft one in the family, so I guess they have a point. Probably would not have taken that well. Still going through the whole process of living in two houses and trying to figure out what really happened to BTS. So I don't know your whole situation, and I'm not at all judging what you've said here. I, do, I don't want to come across that way. I did just want to add in, folks, that parents getting divorced, people getting divorced, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a failing. It just happens in some relationships. And, you know, yes, yeah, so sometimes it's incompatibilities. There might be fighting in the background that you weren't seeing, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. And I just like to say that because kids seeing, you know, family members, you know, their parents divorcing, I don't want you to think that it's some awful dark secret because that almost kind of implies that it should be shameful. And I don't think it is. I think we need to get rid of that stigma around divorce. It can be the healthiest option and best way to proceed forward for some folks. So... That's all I wanted to say. Otherwise, I am sorry for what you've personally gone through. I, Like I said, I don't want to dismiss your own feelings and what you've been through. Walmart employees, what's the worst thing you've seen? Viewer edition. Story one. Worked at Cinemark for about six months. Ovens were broken for the majority of that time, and we weren't able to get them fixed until around a month before I left. This is why I really appreciated our managers. They were a lot better than expected. After the ovens got fixed, we could finally make pizza for people. A lady ordered a pizza and my co-worker was doing everything right, but the oven wasn't set right or something, so the pizza wasn't cooking right. We tried several times to cook her pizza, but I ultimately had to tell her that we weren't able to make her pizza, but we could refund her and make her something else. She called me pathetic and stormed away. I wasn't even involved until about two minutes before speaking with her. Mentioned it to an assistant manager afterwards so they're aware I'm required to report negative customer interactions, and then mentioned it to the GM a bit later too. The GM tells me that next time I need to find him immediately so that he can kick them out. He was peed about his employee being treated that way. He was great. Another time, a customer's card wasn't going through. I was trying to help troubleshoot it, trying different scanning types, checking our systems, etc. But it wasn't working, the system checked out. He said that it was going through on his side, called an assistant manager over to help. Figured it out. He hadn't been scanning it correctly, so it wasn't picking it up. He lied about it going through on his end, as the manager saw it hadn't. He got angry at us and was cursing us under his breath, pointedly talking about missing his movie, etc., and the manager had to look him in the eye and say, Sir, we are doing the best we can to get you into your movie. We can't control the machinery. You do not speak to my employee that way. You need to be respectful and patient. Appreciate her, too. Okay, I came into this video fully expecting to just read a whole bunch of stories about people pooping where they shouldn't poop, because that's what the last Walmart video was. And instead, I get to see, yeah, some crappy customers, but hear about good managers. Hey, management, be like these people. <laughs> Seriously, have your employees' backs. If customers are crappy, get rid of them. As uh, some other video said, I can't remember exactly, but... One good employee is worth more than one bad customer or something. I don't know. Or, yeah. Story two. People get arrested at my Walmart quite often, and one arrest I saw that sticks with me is when two cops arrested a woman for shoplifting while they were shopping. They were in uniform, so my guess is they were buying stuff for the station. One cop came out with her in handcuffs, and the other came out with a cart full of supplies and groceries and loaded them both up in their SUV. Yes, some cop cars are SUVs in my city. Another thing was this time a friendly stray dog was walking around the parking lot going up to people to be pet. That was a fun day. Another thing that happened was this one time me and a co-worker had to crawl into an older, obese woman's minivan to get her chihuahuas so she can put them in her electric cart basket. She couldn't leave them in her van because the battery, it was messed up. I'm pretty sure that's what she was there to buy, and it was like 90-something degrees outside. She had five of those adorable little rat dogs. One time I found a butt plug on the floor of the men's restroom. 
I left it alone, but it was gone later, so either the owner came back for it or maintenance actually touched it and threw it away. There was also this guy who told me how crashing his motorcycle to avoid hitting a turtle in the road led to him becoming religious and finding God. A funny little thing that happened during Christmas Eve last year was this a-hole had parked their suburban car so that it took four parking spots. Someone wrote the N-word in the dust-covered windshield, so that should tell you what other people thought of that. There was this time that a woman got run over. She was fine, mostly. Apparently, the owner of the vehicle didn't park, and it had backed over a woman walking behind it, and had gone over the grass, separating the parking lot from a McDonald's parking lot. Not sure what happened to the owner of the car. I've had to fish around under people's trucks to get a stray kitten that had crawled up under there. Most of the people that happened to happily take them home, too. There's a few more, but those are the most memorable. Well, aside from the grossness of people using racial slurs, um, there's a lot going on in that story. Um, the, the butt plug in the bathroom, I'm hoping whoever got that was wearing, you know, rubber gloves, if not using, like, one of those plastic grabbers. Um... Yeah, and the guy hitting, not hitting a turtle and finding God, that's, um, that's an interesting way to find God. Story three. I didn't work at a Walmart, but a little family-owned grocery store in a small town. There's a group home down the street for mentally handicapped people who can't live on their own. Sometimes the workers would bring some of the higher-functioning residents with them when they went shopping. I was a cashier one day, and I was ringing up groceries for one of the workers and a resident. The resident, who was an older male, probably about 60 or so, mumbled something about needing to use the restroom. The worker didn't hear him. He said it again a bit louder. I knew she heard him this time, but she ignored him. Pretty soon he just walked out of the store, and I noticed he was leaving a trail of liquid behind him. He had peed himself at the register and tracked it through the front of the store and outside. The worker stepped around it and paid the bill and then left without even saying anything about it. I was mad. Not at the old man who peed himself. I felt bad for him. I was mad at the worker who ignored him and then ignored the fact that he peed on the floor. One of the other cashiers knew the worker's name, so after I'd gotten it cleaned up, our manager called the group home to complain. We never saw that worker again. Yeah, I hope you never saw that worker again, because that worker deserves to have been fired. Very, I mean, this is coming as someone who used to work in group homes with people with various developmental disabilities. You treat them like people. They are people. And if something like that happens, you can't just act in that way. They deserve to be treated with decency. And you're out there in public to help them out. Just no, 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 no. Yeah. I am glad that you got that reported and the manager called them up and complained because, yeah, I can't stand people who would do that. Story four. I work in maintenance. You rarely see the worst of the worst in the bathrooms, but still, it's pretty expected of me to see this, but the worst that I'd seen was in a family restroom. One toilet, one sink, a single-person restroom. It had a funny smell radiating out of it when you got close enough to the door. Grab the stuff needed in case of a cleanup, and lo and behold, the instant I opened the door, I was greeted with a profuse stench of 1,000 clogged toilets. Someone smeared their fecal matter all over a single wall of the square restroom that covered one-third of it. Its appearance smeared in a direction that somebody used their bare hand to shove it all across the wall as much as they could, and that smell? Oof. I quickly got out of there and nearly had to puke in the maintenance bucket. The Walmart I work at doesn't usually supply us with gas masks or hazard suits, though I wish they did. The only thing I could find related to a stench protection mask was just those napkins everybody had to use to go out during the COVID crisis. Needless to say, I didn't clean up that bathroom. I waited until someone else did it, as my stomach would surely make me choke up my lunch that day. Story 5. The fact that one of the better stories was a woman encouraging her little boy to shoplift. I feel for the guy who runs this channel and has to read these. Oh, hi. Also, not Walmart, but Meyer, and also my dad. Back when Meyer sold hamsters and guinea pigs, there was this one hamster that all the employees really liked. Really playful, really friendly, just all around lovable. 
One day, this one guy bought the hamster and took it home. Later, he came back with it, demanding a refund because it wasn't healthy. As it turned out, the guy had given this hamster rat poison and was returning it under the pretense that it was sold to him in poor health. I don't remember what happened to the guy, I hope he got charged in some way, but what I do know was that there was nothing anybody could do for the hamster. If I remember correctly, the poor thing ended up dying while being held by one of my dad's co-workers. Rest in peace, little guy. You deserved better. Story 6. I worked at a Walmart a few months ago. I was a cashier and helped with the fitting rooms. One day, I was the only cashier on the non-food side of the store, and a lady with her toddler standing in the cart came to my register. While she was paying, her little boy randomly let loose the floodgates, and honestly, the size of the puddle compared to the kid was impressive. Poor mom was apologizing all over herself, stating that she had tried taking him to the toilet several times. I reassured her that it was okay, as there was only one person behind her, and a spill station was right behind my register. So I put the grainy powder stuff down to soak up the mess as I signal for a manager, and the lady leaves with her items and her toddler. Then came the one person who had been in line behind this entire time. Let's call her Hag. Hag had somehow managed to miss everything. I tried to stop her from pushing her cart through the now wet matter on the floor, and the hag never even looked at me. The hag just gets her stuff paid for and leaves tracking a trail of grainy toddler pee with her because talking to a peasant's cashier is beneath her. People born into cults. What was your, oh crap, moment? Viewer's edition. Story 1. I was never really in a cultish church until high school, but I never really got too attached to the multiple churches we went to growing up. The first one pretty much kicked us out after they removed my dad as Awana Commander, no memory of what it was for, but it wasn't anything bad. The second one we followed to the temporary location while they were renovating the original one, but after we got kicked back to the remodeled location, they started defaulting on the renovation payments and got kicked out to just cease existing after a few months, meeting at the mall movie theater. The third one was good for a while, I even got to go to this absolutely wild place for church camp called Dry Gulch in Oklahoma, but it's sadly closed now. But they just slowly started becoming a megachurch, and by the time my family left, it took friends there almost a half year before they realized we changed churches because they thought we were attending a different service time. The one that was cultish wasn't at first. We had this pretty cool pastor who had a nice family and made everything feel very friendly. But then one day, the pastor completely disappeared, leaving only a small note for his wife and daughter. We believed he entered a fugue state because he just left and went up to South Dakota, we're in Kansas, and married another woman and became a school bus driver. The incident was another moment I was questioning my be this incident was another moment I was questioning my beliefs. But after that pastor left and finished a search and had a new pastor join that it began to get cultish. And I think the fact I was already questioning my beliefs is what kept me from getting fully sucked into the church's cultish descent. At first, the new pastor seemed pretty cool. He and his family moved from Oregon, and he was nice all around, it seemed. But then he slowly started incorporating his faith into the foundation of the church. He didn't believe women could be pastors, fired our really awesome youth pastor. He even wrote up a church constitution that included things such as LGBTQ plus people can't be members of the church, which completely nullified my membership, but I had already left at that point, and even wrote trans bathroom bills into it. My mom was banned from helping out with kids' programs because she constantly stood up to the pastor to show how he had hurtful beliefs and he didn't want my mom poisoning the youth's minds. The thing that finally completely destroyed any connection I had to the church was in the youth group. We used to do a Q&A at the beginning of the year and someone asked if we should allow LGBTQ plus members in our youth group. And besides two friends, I always brought the rest of the room and agreed to say no to LGBTQ members of the youth group. That was the punch in the gut that sent me flying off a cliff. I was so shattered by that one sentence that I almost relieved myself that night. I thought I had a support structure in that youth group, but they pulled the rug out from under me on a dime. But to show you how deeply I still feel I needed to be a part of some faith, I almost joined a local Mormon church, but that's how damaged my view of everything was at that time. 
After I realized that would be a mistake, I went towards witchcraft and paganism, and it gave me beliefs to cling on that didn't come with pain and baggage. And slowly I found a path that fit me so much better, and I didn't know how much I had been hurt until I was out of the church. When I moved out of town for college, I found a witchy group that met in a public park, and they helped me shed my baggage even more so that I became confident I didn't need to go back to that oppressive cave I grew up in. I've definitely been left with some religious trauma, probably not as much as some of the people in this video, but whatever. Sorry, I just wrote a bunch. <laughs> First off, please don't be sorry. I really enjoyed reading that whole thing. Um, you know, we have some things in common. I was very into church when I was younger, up through high school, and uh, my own church was uh, very much against uh, LGBTQ plus stuff. And for me, figuring myself out, that was a huge blow to me. That was emotionally devastating, and it caused me a lot of inner turmoil into my mid-20s. It's hard to go through, and I'm glad that you were able to shed that baggage. Because as much as I am not a Christian, um, I don't like Christian churches doing stuff like this. It's not very Christian. These churches are supposed to be opening, open and welcoming and like, you know... Hey, we want to like, you know, teach you Jesus. He was he was nice. He was a welcoming person. He sought out people, you know, who didn't share his ways and you know, just tried to teach by example. I don't know. There's so much that that kind of stuff just makes me so sad and I'm glad you were able to find a better place and I'm hoping anyone else out there struggling with this just know that you're A-OK, -okay, LGBTQ+, all that, and if your church is trying to tell you that it's not OK, then it's OK to get out. Story 2. I have a funny story. To try and make it as short as possible, my best friend was really into this Mormon chick, so he became Mormon for a time so he could date her, otherwise he would have, wouldn't have been able to. After the chick's family moved to Utah near the Mormon Mecca, as I refer to it, they invited him to go down so he could visit. He asked if I wanted to come, so I offered to drive since I had a car that could make the trip. After we got there, we slept, and when we woke up, the family wanted to take us on a tour of the Mormon Mecca place to go visit the tabernacle and see all the art and watch the Life of Joseph Smith movie or whatever it was called. The art in the building were undeniably damn amazing. I thought all the marble temple buildings and things were a bit pompous, but very nice, and a lot of the art was very damn awesome to view. When it came to watching the movie, I literally laughed at a scene where the Smith dude and his two disciples or whatever got captured, and the captors were beating up one of them, then Smith stands up, still bound and a prisoner, and just shouts, YOU LEAVE THAT MAN ALONE! And the effing captor did just that. I legit laughed audibly, and every head within a 30-foot radius stared at me, and I could see all of them had been crying. I tried to stay quiet after that for the sake of my friend. Then when he went to the tabernacle, the dropping of the pen demonstration was pretty cool, and it did have some legit wicked acoustic qualities. But the BS they talked about this certain column being predicted to have the exact size for an elevator, even though it was built way before elevators were made, made me laugh. Yet again. After the tabernacle tour, I had a couple questions upon seeing something peculiar entering the tabernacle. I turned to the guide, she had to have been maybe 17 at most, and I asked her, if y'all are Mormon, why is there a Jew star above the doors? She kind of paused and replied, Jew star? Yeah, Star of David, that's a Jewish symbol. She says, uh, let me get an elder. Elder arrives and I ask her the same question. At this point, the bro and that family were a bit away while I asked these questions. Elder replies, they might have just created this before they knew of Jewish people and liked the design. And I say, but it's still a Star of David, y'all are Mormon, wouldn't that be blasphemous? She replies, maybe you should go. Said thanks and effed off. Funniest crap ever, lol. Also, Utah was the first and last strip club I went to. It was so sad, it totally killed the experience for me. I was freshly 18 and never had been to one before, and never again, damn it. Okay, real quick, I just want to say, folks, don't join a religion just because you're interested in someone who's in that religion. That's not... <laughs> 
join a religion because it calls to you, because it has beliefs that you connect with and you feel like it's, you know, for you. But, oh, if you join a religion just because it's like, ooh, I like this person and they happen to be such a religion, so no, I will be. That's just setting up so many problems for the future. Story 3. My family broke off from their Protestant church, as in, I broke off, tried all the local churches, then decided no one was right except us. Us being my dad. My eye-opening experience was when my dad tried to describe hell for the second time. First time was fire, brimstone, lake of fire, etc. Second time? The Lord showed me what hell truly is, to ensure you all don't go there. The typical fare for priests wanting to make their own rules, but what was hell? Nothingness. Seriously, full sensory deprivation, alone with your thoughts for eternity. No pain, no changes, just you and your thoughts as your body rots in the earth. Not only did I see that as BS, I noticed he'd recently seen how one guy went mad with full sensory deprivation before he came up with this, but I also realized it was probably the worst way to scare me into obedience. Why? I love being alone, in silence, not even noticing my own bodily functions. Seriously, parents thought time out alone in my room facing a wall was a punishment, but I loved it because it was quiet and I was alone with my thoughts. Kid me loved the idea of nothingness, just my thoughts. Seriously, they forgot I was locked away in time out for three hours once. The only reason it ended was because I realized I was hungry and I was actually aching. Never happened during time up before, and the time was supposed to be the usual 15-minute fare. Figured something was wrong and peeked out to ask if my time was up, didn't mind a time reset if needed, more time for me, but still. And boom, they realized they forgot me. And while they hate the story, claim it's guilt, I say it's because sign of child abuse, I love it. Because I sat there for hours, staring at a wall, thinking of all these funny little things, doing my own little thing in my head. And the only thing that stopped me happened to be cues from my own body. Cues that wouldn't exist in Dad's version of hell. So yeah, that was my wake-up call. Dad is making up a new version of hell. Siblings of Psychopaths, What Was Your Experience? Viewer's Edition. Story 1. My brother had some rough times growing up because our father was a bit emotionally damaged from, you know, being a refugee and nearly being murdered as a toddler. I did try to shield him, but I'm A, autistic myself, and B, was a kid at the time. So fast forward, my brother has gotten this very young woman, as in just 18, pregnant, and she says her roommate is abusive. So I helped him get her out of there to move into my mom's house with me. I was saving up for another master's. But weirdly, they don't allow me into her apartment. I thought it was weird at the time, but figured her ex roomie was just incredibly toxic. Now I think they were afraid that if I had a conversation with the ex roomie it would be a lie. Then under the drive back, she started talking about how we needed to rehome our cats because she doesn't like cats. Also note, this woman likes to have hamsters, gerbils, guinea pigs, but they always mysteriously die off super fast. I gently tell her we're not rehoming our cats and carry on. A few weeks or a month into all this, I get a call from my mom that this woman is accusing me of doing the same things she accused her ex roomie of doing, for example, mistreating her pets and stealing her food. Note, she was throwing my food in the garbage and wouldn't allow me to use the kitchen. She also wanted me to pay rent to her, not my mom, for living in my mom's house, and as my brother had decided to marry her, wanted to wear my mom's wedding dress. Also note, my mom made the point of saying that my brother was doing this out of a sense of responsibility for getting her pregnant and definitely did not love her. My mom did not approve, but loved my brother and wanted him to make his own choices. I suspect the choice wasn't actually his. None of this worked, so they didn't invite my mom or me to their wedding. My new sister-in-law starts sending me super abusive emails accusing me of all manner of nonsense, and my brother starts saying that I'm stealing money from the family to fund my lifestyle. I took out loans, got scholarships, worked part-time jobs, budgeted, my budgeted to finance my education, and while my mom was supportive and did help where she could, lol, no, I didn't con my family. I did finally confront him on this when he accused me of conning our father into paying for my doctorate. 
As I said, I got all the funds together to pay for my doctorate, and there actually was a moment where I completed early, and the school tried to get extra tuition out of me, so when my brother told me my father had been paying the school while they were also taking payment for me, I just about accidentally called his bluff because I thought the school was double-dipping. Double no, turns out my brother, probably at the behest of his wife, was just trying to make me feel guilty about earning advanced degrees. I go away for school, and immediately upon landing and calling my mom, she tells me that my sister-in-law has threatened to cut my mom off from my brother and their children if my mother doesn't disown me and stop speaking to me full stop. So we would have to conduct our mother-daughter relationship in secret. My sister-in-law would drop in on my mother and check her mail to try and enforce this ban on my mom talking to me. I went to a family wedding, and because my mom hadn't been able to send me gifts, etc., for years, she secretly paid for my and my partner's room, and we met with her and my grandmother in secret. Later, my mother gets terminal cancer and passes away. I'm allowed to come home to see her, but my awful sister-in-law is openly ecstatic that my mom is dying and guilts my brother for spending time with her in her last days and hours. Later, they accused me of setting up traps for their children. I had left a box of school supplies for the kids out. And for the memorial, she tries to demand a special performance or something just for her and her kids. It was massively inappropriate. So while I did let her participate, I didn't do what she wanted me to do. And so, of course, she screams at me. My brother screams at me. And about a month afterwards, I get another abusive, nasty email from her where she explains that I'm a bad daughter and didn't deserve my mom's love. Supposedly, I wasn't inclusive enough of her and made the funeral all about me. I mean, mom's friends thought it was a great goodbye, and they had less participation than she did, so it was a cool story. I think it was because my mom was really supportive of me singing, and so I sang two songs she really loved. One was a song she would always request I sing for her, and another was a song she requested for her wedding. At the service, and chose music for everyone else that matched mom's theme, and that I knew she would like or did like. But the sister-in-law bills herself as a professional musician and was angry that I had sight-read the second song initially and was ready to perform it within a month because she can't read music. So, of course, anyone with more technical skill than her is automatically very bad, no good, regardless of the purpose. Also, I just remembered this one. While my mom was dying, she asked me to sing an entirely different song for her. So my sister-in-law decides she's going to accompany me on the accordion. I initially agreed and let her get some practice time with the music because I figured she's a professional and she'll be able to do it. She could not. It was a disaster. She couldn't manage it at tempo, and given that it was a very light waltzy waltz with fast vocal runs, it sounds terrible. I gave her a few chances to get up to speed, but she just couldn't, so finally I told her thanks for trying, but just let me sing this a cappella. Temper tantrum ensues. And remember, my mother had made a deathbed request to hear me sing this song. During all this, I was trying to repair my relationship with my brother, but he would not answer my emails, some of his messages didn't sound like him, and would never agree to a phone call. We could do FaceTime slash Skype, and so I did. Until I found out that the reason for this is she was seated just off camera supervising. She was afraid that if I spoke to my brother privately, I might be able to reverse her brainwashing. Yada yada, she tried to steal my inheritance, continually fat shames me. She is considerably heavier than I am and knows I suffer from anorexia. As in, while we were living under the same roof, most of my clothes were size zero. And she's not obese. I don't think she's ever been under a size 12 was at least verbally abusive to my mom, couldn't keep pets including a dog alive, told my mom I deserve to be homeless, and told me I'm probably infertile and far too old to have kids. So I've made the decision to give up on her, and while I am terrified for my niece and nephew and I suspect my brother is a battered husband, I've decided to cut them off until he divorces her or the kids grow up, realize their mother is a malignant narcissist, and decide to get out of there. My partner and I are going to have kids and get married, but I sadly can't invite my brother or his kids or even tell them about their cousins because I genuinely do think that his awful wife will try to hurt my children or my partner's family if she's ever given knowledge of them slash is in contact with them. It's really sad, but I don't think she can ever get better. 
I think she will always be like this, and it's just heartbreaking in all its iterations. I did actually go into the thread to see if it was my brother, and no, I don't think it is. I do hope that guy is safe. First, thank you so much for sharing your story, and uh, I'm really sorry that you've had to deal with that. I've had someone like this in my family, but it was a little more distant relative, and so it didn't personally affect me as much, but I did see how hard it was on so many family members. And yeah, it sounds like this person has some major problems and really needs some therapy and is putting a lot of the rest of your family through hell, and that sucks so bad. And I'll just say, I think that you made the right call just cutting them off. There's only so much you can do. You can't force your brother to see what kind of person she is. He has to do some of the work himself. And he has to know what other people think, you know? Like, it it can't be... He can't be that oblivious to it. So, yeah. I, I think he made the right call as much as it hurts and sucks. And I hope one day he's able to break away and you can repair that relationship. Story two. I was abused and bullied by my own bio mother, raised by my grandparents, and youngest brother, mom's golden child, in almost every way imaginable except for S. Nothing was ever their fault, and people blaming them were nuts and conspiring against them. If they insulted us, it's because we asked for it. But if we retaliated, we were the evil ones making their lives hell. If our youngest brother stole things from us, mom would defend him with, he's not stealing it, you'll get it back, or he's not even going to play with it that long, or outright not even say a word about it. My Pokemon Sapphire game went missing for over half a year once, and when I found it, it turned out my little brother had it the entire time, and my mom knew but didn't care, then to still try to justify why she wanted to take it away from me again. They would call us some of the most horrible things out there, which I took the most impact from. And I'm taking things no mom should say to her own kids, and things no child should ever be heard saying, then she'd justify it by saying the usual lazy parent excuse of, he's a kid, he doesn't know any better, or... He doesn't even know what it means, so let him say it. But if we returned the insults, she'd immediately play victim, something she constantly did, and say how the words hurt her. She was also one of your typical reborn Christian hypocrites, so she'd often preach her holier-than-thou garbage and then turn right around and do the exact opposite of what she preached. All this while the crazy bee still had the audacity to get peed at the world and scream, Nobody loves my baby, while acting like she wasn't the reason behind it. This doesn't even scratch the surface because there's the amount of people she's alienated because of her god-awful attitude towards others. Family outside of her own mother don't talk to her or even want to stay in touch. Whatever friends she had no longer talk to her since she outright cut many of them out since some of them had the nerve to raise their voice at her precious baby. And no, it wasn't because of discipline. One of them just shouted at them to stop playing in the middle of the street when a car was approaching and none of her kids want anything to do with her from all the abuse. The only one who does is our youngest brother, and even he can't stand her anymore, but tolerates it because he wants to be a leech. Sorry this is so long, but it's something I needed to vent. I've cut my mom out of my life for two years now, and I feel so much better. The crap I had to deal with still affects me, but no longer dealing with her has been the best decision of my life. No apologizing for length. It was the length that it needs to be, and I'm glad that you shared it. And I think this is also an important lesson for some people struggling with, like, you know, parents or stuff like this. And that's, it's okay to cut those people out of your life. You don't owe family that much. You know, like, yeah, if you can try and make amends and make things work, that's great. But if they are literally damaging to your mental and or physical health, you have every right to just cut them out of your life because it's going to be what's best for you. And if that, you know, bridge is going to get repaired, they're going to have to be the ones to start to do the work. At work, what's a red flag that only the people who are the lowest on the totem pole are likely to notice? Story one. 
Unpaid bills. As the bottom of the totem in a financial department for a small nonprofit, I was the one putting bills into the system and then would print checks and mail them out when the higher ups said to. When I first started, almost every bill was behind. They covered it up by claiming the person I was replacing hadn't been able to keep up with the workload, and that was why everything was late. I spent over half my time on the phones talking to companies about not shutting down our utilities. Maybe the last person was that slow, but it was not that much. Full-time work, yes, but too much, dog trash. Fortunately, the right man had come in as CEO just before me, and he literally saved the company from collapse. I just happened to see what should have been the end of the company. He was smart, though. No bills were paid until employees had been paid, and no bills but critical ones were paid at all. Then he paid massive portions of debt off quickly to put us back in acceptable standing as we worked out payment plans. That man saved a small company with a million-dollar deficit in under a year. I work in a different department now, but its annual profit is now around two mil. Dang, we actually get to start off with a, you know, kind of a little feel good, good news story. You know, things turned out okay, and I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, and paying the employees first, that is very important. And if they're not paying employees first or on time, that's a red flag. So, uh, yeah, good little lesson just tucked in there. Story two. Bosses who take responsibility for nothing. I had a boss regularly tell me how to do something incorrectly. Her boss would correct her, then she would punish me for doing it wrong, for doing exactly what she told me to do. She'd do things like spill a coffee all over a worker's super important documents, then not apologize or admit it was her fault or even an accident she was responsible for. No, she blamed a step stool that was on the floor next to her that wasn't even in the way of her sitting down or the counter. Coworker was crying while I was trying to rescue the papers, and boss spent the whole time being a bee about the step stool because she was too embarrassed and immature and disrespectful to own up to it. These are genuinely some of the worst bosses. Bosses who will not, you know, admit when they've made a mistake. And also, you know, they love to blame their employees for doing a bad job. But the fact is, you know whose job it is to help make sure the employees are doing a better job and being taught properly? I'll give you a hint. It's you, terrible boss. It's you. Story three. One, my daughter's first job out of college last year was working for a small internet marketing company. Her entire department was given an unexpected furlough during the last two weeks of December, and I told her to start looking. She got a layoff notice after Christmas via the instant messaging platform they used. Classy. She now works for a much better company. Story two, one of our favorite restaurants, locally owned, stopped taking credit and debit cards. Their machine was broken. This was before the rise in popularity of services like Venmo and Apple Pay. They would occasionally have their phone disconnected. They've been out of business for a few years now. Story 4 The top guy sees everyone else as the help. I work for a company where the corporate office is probably like 25 people. On my first day, I was in the break room by myself, and then the guy that hired me and the owner walked in, and the owner went to the coffee pot. The guy that hired me said, Hey, Jam, this is BTL89, the newest member of our team. Owner doesn't even turn and look at me and just goes, oh, and puts a lid on his coffee and walks out without even looking my way. I lost a ton of respect for him and the company that day, especially after my interview two days prior. They were talking up how much they care about their employees. I do think it is important that a workplace care for their employees. I think it's extremely important. Um, I am always... Very suspicious, though, when workplaces talk too much about that. Like, oh, we we love our employees so much. We take care of them. And by God, if a workplace says, when you're here, you're not just an employee, you're family. Run. Absolutely run. Unless the person doing the hiring is like a sweet old grandmother giving you some like tea and biscuits. No employer who says that their company is like a family should be trusted, in my opinion. Story 5. I realize this doesn't count, but civilians may find this interesting. In the Navy, United States, it's a well-known, and at least it wasn't my ship, oftentimes true fact that if out of nowhere the ship's galley, kitchen, 
serves steak and lobster, there is bad news coming from the captain, usually in the form of you're going on an unexpected deployment, your deployment's being extended, or something along those lines. It happened to us multiple times as to where we hated seeing that on the menu, and after dinner like clockwork, the captain hit us with the bad news. Story 6. This applies more to the tech industry, but when the CEO calls a meeting out of the blue and says they have plenty of funding, start interviewing. Should have done this at my last insurance gig. They suddenly brought us all in and told us we were all secure in our jobs, despite a recent turnaround in the market. One guy in my department started looking immediately. He left shortly thereafter. Two weeks after he left, they told everybody we were getting canned in four months. Story 7. As someone who used to be busy most of the time, the fact that I found myself stretching 30 hours of work into 40 all of a sudden was the first sign of bad times soon. Shortly after that started, our boss announced that there was a cash flow problem due to a combination of factors. Less work, clients not paying, projects not progressing, thus not being able to bill hours, etc. I started looking for work immediately. Have had some interest, but uh, nothing concrete yet. The first person got let go last week, a recent hire. I doubt I'm next, but you never know. Story 8. When you all get the speech that you need to give 110% to the job and be a team player willing to take on more roles. On the surface, this does not seem bad, but what my experience taught me is it translates out to... We've let people go, we are not rehiring, we expect all of you to take on those other jobs too, with no additional pay. And if they start playing funny games with breaks, lunch hours, and overtime, or demanding work after you've clocked out, it is time to get the F out. Look everyone, it's not our fault that business is doing bad, it's your fault. You're not doing enough, and it has nothing to do with the way we run things and the decisions that we've made up top, even though we've uh, decided that we're so important that we deserve to make so much more than you. No, it's definitely all of you who have failed us. Story 9. At my husband's large Fortune 50 company, they were laying off several dozen people each quarter starting in 2009. Your department would get an email to meet at an off-site conference facility Friday morning. From there, those being let go would be handed a box with your personal stuff, a brown bagged lunch, a packet with your severance info in exchange for signing a corporate waiver, and handing in your badge. You didn't get to clean out your office, say goodbye, finish your work, you were just gone. This went on for nearly three years. Terrible way to live. He managed to make it to retirement, but to this day, he can't look at a brown bag lunch. That's cold as F. Story 10. Missing payday. If you get paid on Wednesday and Friday comes without pay, don't bother coming in on Monday. Friday payday. No pay comes at the end of the day on Monday, walk out. No other reason you're there. You work for pay. Story 11. Whenever we got a cheap gift or some new perk from a corporation congratulating us on increased profits for the year, it was pretty much a guarantee that a month later we'd be told that there would be no bonus. Thanks. I can't wait to pay rent with this coffee mug full of pre-dried out ballpoint pens. Oh, I would rather that a company not give me anything rather than give me just a cheap garbage gift. No joke, I worked for a big, multi-million dollar company owned by an extremely wealthy person, well known as it were. And for my birthday, my first birthday with the company, my gift from the company was like a $5 Subway gift card. I would rather they had spit in my mouth then disrespect me with that. Okay, I was a little intense with that. I have come back to add some clarification. It is also that, like, the supervisors and managers were getting, like, multi-thousand dollar bonuses and stuff like that, and the rest of us, like, sales workers were being given trash like that. It's not that I hate Subway, though I don't like it. <laughs> Story 12. Was once told by the cleaner, this place is fricked. 
I used to change the toilet rolls in the bogs twice a day, now it's barely twice a week. They're either crapping less or we're getting less clients through the door. She was absolutely correct. Place got extremely downsized within six months of that. Story 13. Late pay. I've heard a few stories from people who have been paid late and stayed instead of looking for a new job, then later being made redundant. If the cash flow is so bad, payroll is coming late, it's time to get out of there. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.